Welcome to this uh, first CSSR fall webinar uh, titled uh, The Loss of Indigenous Eden with uh, Dr. Blair Stonechild. And uh, yeah, thanks to all of you uh, for being here with us today. It's so great to see uh, many of you uh, from our little community up here in Canada. Uh, my name is uh, Sarah Wilkins Laflamme. I'm the membership secretary for the Canadian uh, Society for the Study of Religion, uh, as well as an assistant professor in sociology and legal studies at the University of Waterloo. I'm going to be your Zoom master uh, for today. So I'm kind of uh, the one a bit behind the scenes for the most part and just making sure everything runs smoothly. Uh, before I pass on the mic over to our president, Paul, to introduce our speaker, I just wanted to say a few quick words about the webinar series overall that we're starting uh, today. Um, as many of you know, our 2020 CSSR conference this past spring was cancelled uh, due to COVID-19, along with pretty much every other conference this year, uh, in person at least. Um, but we uh, at the CSSR executive really still wanted to showcase some of the great talent and scholarship uh, that we have here and that's being done on religion and spirituality in Canada. Uh, so we've organized this webinar series, a bit of a kind of not quite full, but at least partial replacement uh, to our cancelled 2020 conference. Um, so for the webinars this fall, we selected a number of sessions that were originally planned for that 2020 spring conference. Uh, the conference, the program that was co-chaired by Quamer Hamid and Michelle Folk. So thank you to those two members of our executive for putting the initial program together. And we picked sessions that specifically address the theme of the 2020 Congress uh, that of bridging divides, confronting colonialism, and anti-Black racism. Uh, so now just a quick word now before we move on on to uh, how things are going to unfold over the next hour and a half or so. Um, uh, Paul's going to do the second set of introductions and then uh, the first 45 minutes or so will be dedicated to Blair's presentation. And then after that we'll have about roughly 30 minutes or so for Q&A uh, from you, the audience. Uh, I would ask that during Blair's presentation if you could remain muted just to kind of cut down on the background noise. And then to ask a question during the Q&A, uh, uh, please post your question or just like a little shout out indication uh, in the chat that you'd like to ask a question in that chat. So you'll see, uh, for those of you less familiar with Zoom, you'll see that chat option at the bottom of your screens in the center. So you just click on chat and you'll see the chat box up here. So anytime during the webinar, just post your question or post an indication that you'd like to ask a question. And then after Blair's presentation, Paul's going to go through the chat and just call you out and prompt you uh, to ask your question. And then you can do it in person over your microphone. Uh, just unmute yourself and then ask your question as we'll have a nice, hopefully, Q&A interaction. Um, and then just a reminder, uh, as you know, just as I mentioned earlier, the session is being recorded, uh, the whole thing, so the presentation and the Q&A, uh, and we're go I'm going to clean it up a little bit afterwards and post it on the CSSR YouTube channel so that everyone can view it uh, at a later date. And so, yeah, so welcome again, and Paul, I'll pass the mic over to you. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Sarah, for putting all this together. It is incredible. Really, thank you. Um, first of all, Tanse, uh, bonjour, everybody. Um, I want to recognize that uh, I am I, I am on Treaty Six territory, um, of uh, uh, as well as Papa's Chase territory, in which I live in my house is is on, and in and the Métis uh, Nation of Alberta or Métis Nation homeland. So I'm very happy to be here on Indigenous in Indigenous lands and on Indigenous territories. And, uh, and it's very apt with uh, the talk we're talking today with Blair, uh, Sto Dr. Blair Stonechild, who we're very lucky to have with us um, today. Um, so I'm gonna do a little brief introduction so that everyone knows uh, Blair. Um, so he was uh, uh, scheduled for um, the CSSR program this year. Um, so uh, Blair Stonechild is a member of the uh, Muscow Petong First Nation, so I hope I said that right and is a survivor of the Capel Indian Residential School. He obtained his bachelor's degree from McGill and a master's and doctoral degree from University of Regina. In 1976, Blair joined the First Nations University of Canada and as its first faculty member, which is amazing, and has been Dean of Academics and Executive Director of Development. Major publications, which everyone should read, uh, include Loyal Till Death, Indians uh, and the Northwest Rebellion, 1997, the New Buffalo Aboriginal Post-Secondary Policy in Canada, 2006, Buffy St. Marie, It's My Way, 2012, the two really important books uh, related to Native, to Indigenous studies and to religious studies, um, The Knowledge Seeker, Embracing Indigenous Spirituality, 2016, as well as The Loss of Indigenous Eden, 
the Fall of Spirituality 2020, which is the center of this talk. So we are very lucky to have you here, uh, Blair. So take it away. Thank you. Very well, first of all, uh, <clears throat> let me uh, just uh, say that I'm very privileged and pleased to be able to uh, make a talk here today. Also mention that I'm an adjunct professor with the um, uh, in Religious Studies Unit at the University of Regina. Now, uh, before I begin, it's uh, customary for us to say a brief prayer, so I'd like to start with that. Uh, simply uh, want to acknowledge the Creator. Thank you, Creator, for the gifts of creation, and uh, thank you for this opportunity for us to get together on this uh, wonderful technology. Um, help us to understand today in this presentation how Indigenous spirituality really reflects your will, how Indigenous spirituality was the original instructions, as we like to call them, and uh, that uh, today we may uh, be able to create greater understanding between uh, Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people. So uh, thank you in the name of all of our relations. So having said that, uh, <clears throat> I can, uh, I guess, go to the uh, next screen there on the slides. So this is the book which uh, I, uh, my talk is focused on. It just came out this spring in April. And um, it is um, uh, University of Regina Press. And uh, unfortunately, just as I was about to have my book launch, the pandemic hit and uh, so everything was canceled. And so uh, I am uh, uh, trying to um, obviously bring it to people's attention. And I think that it's uh, particularly germane in my view to, um, to um, religious studies. As a matter of fact, I'm finding there's more interest in religious studies in this book and this topic than there is in Native studies. So I'm uh, again, really pleased uh, to be able to uh, speak with you today. So we can go to the next slide. First of all, let me just uh, talk about a bit about my own background and a bit about the reasons why I wrote this book. And uh, I guess you might see uh, you know, how, how it kind of came about, how it was born, so to speak. The place I'd start is by talking about my residential school experience. I um, was in the uh, residential school at uh, Labrette, Saskatchewan from 1956 to 1965, a period of nine years. And um, <clears throat> one of the, uh, of course, that uh, whole experience left quite an indelible mark on me. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, I've been in uh, the area of education pretty well my whole life. You know, I've been here at First Nations University for over 40 years and of course I went to university before that and elementary school and high school and you know they talk about how residential school kind of has such an impact on you that uh, you know you almost feel like you've been institutionalized and so sometimes I think <laughs> that's what happened to me I'm still in, in the uh, educational uh, institution in a sense but uh, some of the main things that I really remember from my residential school experience of course were the nature of the uh, institution it was um, you know, it was extremely rigid. The uh, philosophy of the schools was based around uh, what we call the reformatory model. It's that we needed correcting through physical distance. But the other part of it, of course, was uh, the whole idea of moral development. And, uh, you know, part of the uh, belief was that, um, you know, as uh, ignorant savages, so to speak, we needed to be civilized and Christianized. And so there was a great deal of emphasis on, uh, on uh, uh, you know, teaching us uh, um, well, all the elements of Catholicism, you know, whether it's masses, um, prayers, rosaries, and, um, you know, we prayed, uh, I would say, probably, you know, a dozen times a day from the time that we got up before and after meals, before and after classes, and the evenings, and that type of thing. So uh, it, was, it was very heavy indoctrination, but from my own point of view, one of the things which I found myself experiencing was... Uh, a, a curiosity about you know what what it was all about and um, you know there was always a sense that while these uh, stories from the Bible were interesting that it somehow didn't for me didn't quite carry a you know like a, a, a you know sort of a there was a, a sense of not really being real and, and practical and applicable to you know to my own life and what I was seeing and uh, <clears throat> you know my recollection of um, my um, Indigenous uh, relatives, my Kokum and Mushum and all my relatives is that they're very humble and kind people and so the type of things that they're talking about and the way they were portraying Indigenous people simply uh, to me didn't, uh, you know, didn't seem to f fit and I, 
kind of uh, when I was in school really wanted to kind of get to the bottom of this to really understand what everything was about. And in particular, I had this um, <clears throat> conviction that um, <clears throat> there was more to what the eye, eye can see. I was very curious as to, um, you know, what was sort of behind behind it all in terms of existence. And and uh, I, um, I didn't really, uh, I guess you might say, my, I didn't really feel like I was getting satisfactory answers. And so I, uh, <clears throat> of course, left uh, residential school, went to complete high school lecture in Regina, went to McGill University from there. And then after came back to the University of Regina where I, um, it was fortuitous, the um, Saskatchewan Indian Federal College and all the first uni uni uh, nation's university of Regina was just starting in 1976. And uh, <clears throat> so like again, it was very fortuitous timing and I was hired as the very first faculty member back in 1976. So again, just to come to the second point on the uh, panel, of course, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, among the various um, abuses identified at residential schools, identified spiritual abuse as one of them. And essentially it, it consists of the imposition of an alien belief system and the eradication of our indigenous belief system. And of course, I just put a little question there, you know, why was this? And that's something of course that uh, I think I'll get into in, in the course of this presentation. Now, <clears throat> Having started at the First Nations University, I've worked with uh, Indigenous elders for, you know, over 40 years. And um, I've had wonderful opportunity to meet many elders and to listen to them talk about various things. And um, it's interesting that uh, one of the very first elders that I met when I started there was a person by the name of Ernest Tatusis who kept on telling us, he, you know, this was his little phrase, he'd say, you know, indigenous people live in the Garden of Eden, but we never abuse the gift of the Creator. And so that's something that always stuck in the back of my mind. And, um, you know, he uh, was also uh, interviewed on CBC uh, radio at one time by Roy Bonestiel, and, uh, you know, he expressed the very same uh, sentiments in that interview. Now, <clears throat> when the... Um, University first started, we were largely preoccupied with questions of history and questions of treaty rights and protecting rights and that type of thing. And I think at, at that time, there was a great deal of hesitation to sort of speak about spirituality in the context of, uh, you know, what, what's generally viewed as a colonial institution. And so it took a lot of time for uh, the elders to begin opening up about spirituality. And in our um, <clears throat> tradition and our traditional methods, uh, there's a great deal of protocol when it comes to talking about spirituality. It generally involves things like, uh, for example, in the offering of uh, tobacco to the spirits and, uh, you know, the indication that we are about to engage in some uh, very sacred uh, conversation. And uh, of course, that's the type of conversation which, uh, which um, you know, we uh, are uh, intending to have today. Now, uh, I uh, did write uh, the initial book called uh, The Knowledge Seeker back in, um, let's see what year was it, 2016. And uh, the purpose of that was uh, to, um, again, uh, it was uh, written uh, largely at the behest of elders who were um, saying that it was time for us to become more open about uh, our teachings and to share them because a lot of people, including Indigenous youth, we're losing touch with, with their spirituality. And um, <clears throat> it, uh, so the, the, the purpose of uh, the Knowledge Seeker was to um, demonstrate that Indigenous spirituality is actually a viable system of beliefs. And it was based on the interviews with a number of elders and in particular, uh, my elder mentor who uh, was uh, to me head and shoulders above everybody else in terms of his knowledge of the philosophy and his ability to impart it. And that elder was uh, named uh, Danny Musqua. He uh, taught at the university for 25 years. And so that, uh, as I mentioned, the Knowledge Seeker came out, uh, Knowledge Seeker Embracing Indigenous Spirituality came out in 2016. And um, <clears throat> I hadn't really planned to write another book after that. I thought, well, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot of work and I kind of achieved my objective in terms of saying something. But then what I found is that uh, there were a lot of questions that stem from the knowledge seeker, questions about, you know, particularly about the viability of, um, of indigenous spirituality, is it still a viable 
belief system today, you know, many consider it to be something of the past and, you know, something that's relevant today. And in particular, um, I um, experienced uh, criticism from some quarters, certain people that, uh, that uh, really believe that, um, you know, it was no longer relevant. As a matter of fact, one particular professor attacked it as, as uh, basically a bunch of nonsense that didn't, you know, deserve to be talked about at the university level. And, um, you know, uh, these people tend to be uh, people who are strong subscribers to, uh, you know, the age of reason, the enlightenment, uh, rationalism, and also to an extent, uh, secular uh, materialism. And so, uh, yeah, um, yeah, secular materialism, I guess is what you would call it. And so I will uh, <clears throat> talk about the, uh, what my findings, uh, my research for this book, uh, The Loss of Indigenous Eden. And, um, um, you know, here I just kind of briefly say my research indicates that civilization is a rejection of ancient indigenous beliefs and is a metaphor for banishment from the Garden of Eden. So, I mean, that's just kind of like a, a bit of a teaser, I guess you might say, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what I'm about to talk about. Uh, but we can go to the next slide. Yeah, this is, uh, again, just coming back to residential schools. And um, this um, image, of course, is, uh, you know, it's kind of like the, uh, you know, it's like the stereotypical image. This was the poster boy for residential school, so to speak. Um, this uh, photograph was used broadly in, in uh, federal government uh, propaganda about residential schools and uh, featured a young man by the name of Thomas Moore. And uh, <clears throat> for many years, uh, we used to wonder who this little gentleman was. So it turned out he was from my First Nation. <laughs> it was, uh, he went to the, the um, uh, Regina Industrial School in about, I think it was 1892, something like that. And here in this picture, he's about 12 years old and uh, it's kind of like a before and after picture. And it's interesting how they have him in uh, his uh, traditional regalia before he went to the residential school. And of course, the other thing that's really interesting about this book, this uh, image is if you take a close look, what do you see in his hand? You might notice you see a pistol in his hand, right? And of course, this uh, is kind of, again, a reflection of, you know, the idea of savagery, right? The, uh, you know, the inherently uh, unpredictable and, and, uh, and uh, savage, uh, indigenous person, right? And so, of course, guns were not part of our indigenous culture, but it's certainly planted here to give a message. The uh, next picture of him, of course, is uh, after having been in residential school for a bit, and, uh, you know, he's totally transformed, so to speak. But what you don't get from this picture is the real story of what happened to uh, Thomas Moore. Um, and uh, also maybe just mention that uh, his uh, actual indigenous name was Kishig which uh, means uh, skies or heavens. And um, it so happened that uh, there was a Presbyterian minister by the last name of Moore who worked on a reserve back in those periods. So, you know, we uh, obviously, uh, it would appear that he got that name from, uh, from that source. But what this picture doesn't tell you is that uh, this uh, young gentleman died within a year of this picture from tuberculosis at the Regina in the industrial school. So, you know, that's the story of, uh, of Thomas Moore. Okay, uh, just uh, next uh, image or next slide. Okay, so, you know, we can begin talking about things that we commonly hear and, you know, I can start with the first one. This is something that I commonly heard, of course, in residential school. There was a lot of Bible teaching. Uh, we used to, um, you know, hear a lot of it, uh, especially, um, you know, in the... Uh, context of uh, masses and uh, sermons and that type of thing. And so in the first blurb, it says, in the Abrahamic religions, God told Adam, quote, you may eat of the, any tree in the Garden of Eden except for one, which is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. <clears throat> the next uh, phrase which follows that is interesting. It says, for if you do, you will surely die. And... Um, here I just put a little quotation mark in there, were Adam and Eve actually the first humans or just the first quote unquote civilized people to be who were ex expelled from the Garden of Eden. And so, you know, this is uh, something which many people grew up, you know, the idea that Adam and Eve were the very first humans. And um, so, you know, you kind of get the picture that there was nothing before that. 
and I'll talk a bit more, bit more about that. Um, you know, we don't have that obviously in uh, indigenous uh, traditions. We don't have the story of, of Adam and Eve. As a matter of fact, we have much greater or much different, dramatically different origin stories. And, um, you know, uh, we don't uh, recall in any of our traditions the, uh, you know, the idea of the creator telling us that we're in danger of dying. Now, interesting things, of course, with some of this is, you know, you also hear about this concept of original sin. And, um, you know, people tell us because of this, uh, this, you know, stemming right back from this original sin that, that was committed when Adam and Eve ate of the apple of the tree and good and evil, that therefore we are doomed to sin and punishment. And if you read the Bible enough and uh, listen to some of the evangelical Christians uh, and fundamentalists, you know, you very much get the, uh, the um, uh, you know, the idea that we are in for uh, some sort of a severe reckoning. And uh, of course, uh, interestingly enough, the, uh, in, uh, our elders, indigenous elders, are also telling us uh, that uh, there is uh, something afoot which is going to lead to a severe reckoning with, uh, you know, with, uh, in the world and with the Creator. So I will talk about this a bit more. I have uh, much more to say about this, but we'll leave it at that for now. Uh, other things, you know, when I started doing this uh, research for this book, um, maybe just to kind of give you a bit more of an idea of what was going on as well. You know, I was uh, really uh, curious about where this, uh, you might call it uh, philosophical, ideological conflict between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people began, you know, this whole notion of why Indigenous people needed to be assimilated and why residential schools were created. And I had to find myself, found myself having to go further and further back in history. And so, of course, you know, you can look, you can go back into the history of residential schools. And then, of course, you find yourself going even further back to the actual, um, um, you know, the so-called explorers and contact with, uh, of Europeans with uh, Indigenous peoples in the Americas. And, uh, <clears throat> of course, back then, you find that there was the same kind of ideological uh, conflict that was going on. And so I found myself really having to stretch myself and go back into the new world, old world history. And of course, what I found there were, um, you know, as you go back further and further, you find obviously indigenous people, but you also find this phenomenon of uh, civilization. And I ended up going to the library in desperation, so to speak, and getting a bunch of books on the, or, you know, on the um, birth of civilization. And um, I started reading them. And of course, this takes you back to about 6,000 years ago. And, you know, the books all basically say one thing, which I found interesting. You know, they all say that the um, that uh, civilization began when humanity began to rise up against and to conquer nature. That's, you know, that's, that's a fundamental message that you get in every one of these books on the rise of civilization. And so, you know, I found out that... Um, you know, people, uh, including academics at universities, tend to begin the discussion of uh, human history and the human experience with, with uh, the rise of civilization 6,000 years ago. And I'll talk about this more because, of course, we know that modern humans, and, you know, at this point, I would actually call them indigenous people. Uh, you know, we're here. Uh, it's, uh, it's very broadly agreed that we've been around for 200,000 years. But... Uh, Anyway, let me just move on to a few other uh, characters in history that, uh, that I found interesting. Of course, you have the Greek philosophers. You know, they're famed architects of uh, our thinking in terms of civilization. Of course, we have um, <clears throat> one, we arrive at one who's called Aristotle. And uh, the thing that piqued my interest about Aristotle is a theory that he came up with, which, which was called the theory of natural slavery. And the theory of natural slavery basically said that in a nutshell, basically said that civilized people have a right to, to enslave uncivilized people. And of course, you can put in there, you can substitute that for indigenous people, because obviously these uncivilized people were not as intelligent and didn't have the same kind of, you know, grip over rational thinking and understanding as, uh, as the Greeks did. And of course, he promoted Hellenism, which is basically the concept of uh, assimilating people who were conquered. And uh, <clears throat> of course, um, you know, those of you who know your history will also know that uh, Alexander the Great, who was probably the first great, you know, they call they like to 
people like to praise him as a great conqueror and a great hero and that type of thing. But I mean, he was essentially the first one who left the boundaries of his own territory and, uh, you know, decided that uh, the people around him uh, deserve to be conquered and, uh, you know, their resources taken and, you know, them being subjected to, uh, you know, to, to the Greeks. And of course, Hellenism is the concept that these people should be uh, basically assimilated into Greek culture. And um, at this point, I, I, ru I run into the danger of starting to run off at the mouth because I start getting a bunch of other things I want to say. But at this point, I'll simply uh, just uh, talk about another uh, thing which really gets my goat, which is this uh, constant reference to ancient Greeks and ancient Romans. You know, it's, it, it's set all over. Uh, you know, I like to point out that when you take a look at the whole breadth of, of human history, which uh, human experience, which stretches back to 100,000 years, Greeks and Romans are only, you know, a couple of centuries, a couple of, uh, you know, a couple, let's say maybe, what, two or 3,000 years old. And so I like to say that these are not ancient people. You know, these are people uh, who, who have existed in recent history. If you want to talk about ancient people, you need to talk about people who, let's say, existed prior to the rise of civilization were around for a good 194,000 years before civilization really got any traction. Now we have another gentleman by the name of Julius Caesar, again, another one of these great heroes of civilization who essentially consolidated his power and wealth of the Roman Empire through his, his conquest and slaughter of indigenous peoples of Europe and dispossessions of their lands. You know, he prided himself in... Uh, you know, and literally slaughtering thousands of indigenous people a day. And, um, you know, one of his favorite tactics, of course, was uh, when indigenous people wanted to give a gesture of, uh, you know, of uh, making peace and restoring relationships, he'd say, yeah, let's do that. He'd gather them all together and then pull out his uh, nice sharp swords and basically cut them to bits. And, you know, this is, uh, you know, kind of the uh, type of pattern that I found, again, interesting that that there were indigenous peoples of Europe and, uh, you know, they were, uh, there was a pattern that was being established in terms of uh, what happened to them. Yeah, and then we get, of course, to uh, philosophers of the 18, you know, 1800s uh, and around that era, Descartes, Kant, Locke, who all promote, of course, the Enlightenment, the age of reason, rationalism. And of course, the common thing about all of these people is they declare, declare that there is no such thing as a supernatural anymore. All problems can be solved through one source alone, which is the use of the human mind. And of course, I put in there correct, but, uh, you know, this kind of thinking, um, you know, of, of course, corresponded with many other things, uh, the rise of science and, um, you know, some other, other um, things that were going on. There's the um, uh, Industrial Revolution and many other things. I'll talk about that a bit more. But, uh, you know, even the church bought into this, uh, philosophy, you know, they also uh, began to say that, uh, yeah, you know, like, uh, these guys are right. Uh, let's, uh, you know, let's kind of, let's kind of, let's kind of take, take uh, ease off on the supernatural stuff and let's just go with the rational mind. Uh, next slide. So again, the uh, problem with this kind of presentation is I don't really have much time to um, get into uh, kind of a primer or the basics and in indigenous spirituality uh, the uh, my book knowledge seeker goes into that in great length but uh, in the uh, uh, in this uh, book of loss of indigenous Eden again I, I uh, uh, kind of you know give a bit of a primer because uh, from my research what I found is that uh, the um, indigenous the people so-called pre prehistoric or, or cavemen or whatever you want to call them people they were indigenous people you know, and, uh, you know, they essentially shared the same kind of philosophy that, you know, modern indigenous people do. And of course, uh, modern indigenous people are not, are not very well understood. But uh, the um, nature of the spirituality of uh, people in, 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 you know, indigenous people, and including those people who existed prior to the rise of civilization, is that they have, number one, that they are here they've been allowed to experience the physical life as my mentor, Danny Musco would say, he, he would say we are spirit beings who um, asked to experience physical life on this planet. Uh, and uh, it's interesting because, um, 
you know, I was talking about how we have a much different explanation of how we came here, our explanation. And it's interesting that the name for our people, the Sota, who are Plains and Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe basically means that we came from the stars. And uh, if you take a look at Indigenous, I talk about this in, in the, the uh, Loss of Indigenous Eden. This is the uh, origin story of uh, all of our, you know, virtually Indigenous people. This is the common origin story. It's coming from the stars. And uh, so people might say, well, how did we come here? You know, did we arrive here on UFOs or something like that? The way I understood its experience to me is that spirit is able to uh, travel independent of the physical. And so we came here basically in spirit form and we occupied these uh, physical bodies that existed here before, you know, what you might call ancient humans. We decided that these were suitable um, vehicles for our experience. And so we inhabited these bodies as um, sort of what you might call the master consciousnesses. And uh, so as uh, Mushin Danny Musco used to tell me, he says, you know, we, um, we face this challenge of uh, mastering these physical bodies. And uh, I think that that's basically what, uh, what uh, we as human consciousnesses were doing for the first uh, 200,000 years of our experience on earth is we were uh, mastering these human bodies. But we were always at the, also at the same time we were um, recognizing that we were late beings, that we should be thankful to the creator for the opportunity to experience this. We also need to respect the animal and plant beings who were here before. And uh, we were uh, able to establish communications with these uh, other animal and spirit beings through our ceremonies. And they were the ones that counseled us as to uh, how we should live in this uh, physical world. So here again, we, you know, in terms of things like ontology and that type of thing. Why did we come to earth? Well, according to our teachings, we came to learn to earth to learn. In particular, we came to learn about proper and respectful relationships with the rest of creation, the natural and spirit worlds. And of course, it was critical for us to retain that uh, consciousness and, and connection with the spirit world. And we did that again through our ceremonies, our various ceremonies. And um, again, uh, Mushin Dani told me, he said, he says, life will be a challenge. And uh, there will be a danger that we will lose our way, which I think is what's happened uh, to us today, especially in terms of this phenomenon called civilization. So indigenous ceremonies, the purpose of indigenous ceremonies, and it's interesting that in traditional life, we probably spent more time on ceremonies than any other aspect of life. When we had ceremonies basically from the time we got up till the time that we went to bed. We had ceremonies at different times of the year. We had ceremonies at different stages in our life. And so, you know, we spent a lot of time on ceremonies, which of course, Europeans and uh, Christians called a waste of time. But to us, it, it was, ceremonies were very important because they served the purpose of constantly refreshing our connection to the spiritual, spiritual world, to the spirit world, and constantly reminded us of our responsibilities, the reason why we're on earth and of our responsibilities here, particularly our responsibilities as stewards because uh, we did carry with us uh, the ability to have superior intelligence and that, uh, that uh, power uh, could cut both ways. It could either uh, serve to, to make us uh, bring, I guess you might say, uh, harmony, greater harmony to those animals and plants that existed here because of our ability to, you know, to, to see a, you know, sort of a, a greater level of, uh, of understanding. Or it could, it could serve us to to put ourselves above everything else could serve us to kind of serve our own interests and our greed and uh, and in that we damage our relationships with uh, not only the our our uh, what we call our rel relatives in the in the um, physical world plants and animals but also with the uh, spirit world so what is the basis for our spirituality the uh, you know many people talk about uh, the, um, you know, what we call the seven virtues, which actually were laws of how we should behave. And, um, you know, these were our, so to speak, our Ten Commandments. They included humility, honesty, bravery, respect, generosity, love, and wisdom. And, uh, you know, if we follow these type of things, uh, we didn't need any Ten Commandments that would say, you know, if you, um, you know, if you steal, you'll, you know, that's a sin, or if you, so on and so forth. The interesting thing, of course, about these is they were actually laws. And uh, so it was actually the law to be humble. It was law to be honest. It was law to be respectful, to be generous. And if you broke these laws, there were consequences. 
you know, you could be ridiculed, you could be, you could be exiled, you could ultimately, you could be um, killed, done away with if, if uh, you know, if you transgress from these, uh, uh, you know, in a severe enough way. And um, in our traditions, uh, we had this being called Witigo. It was, a, it was the spirit of selfishness and greed. And uh, that spirit uh, was constantly sort of tempting us, uh, so to speak, to, you know, to go off what we call the good path. And, uh, but we fought very, very diligently to keep that uh, evil at bay. And uh, because of that, we're able to remain on the good path. There are other things I could talk about. There is the uh, spiritual discipline, seven spiritual disciplines. But if you want to know those, you'll have to read my book. I don't want to give everything away here. Now, let me simply say that Indigenous Eden was not a fictional place, as I think it's portrayed in uh, Christianity. Indig Indigenous Eden was our actual uh, experience in the physical world. And um, in the physical world, we actually were provided with all of the things we needed in terms of uh, our ability to, you know, have food and shelter and all of those type of things. All we had to do was basically be respectful. And um, at the same time, Indigenous season was not perfect because Indigenous people were not perfect, you know. They, they could uh, fall away from the, from the laws. They could violate those laws of humility, honesty, bravery, respect, et cetera, et cetera. However, it was through our ceremonies that we were capable of healing and we could always, we could always find a way to return to the good path. Last thing I would say is um, that uh, spirituality is a form of higher intelligence that imparts wisdom. And here again, a lot of people have this mis misconception that Indigenous people do not use, we did not, we were not rational, that we did not use our, our, our minds. Now, um, I take exception to that, you know, we're just as intelligent as everyone else. Our accomplishments, you know, in terms of architecture and um, astronomy, uh, many other things, especially in the area of uh, developing things like, uh, you know, plants are our uh, discovery of medicines and vegetables and uh, all of those type of things. These were all done through spirituality, but they were also done because we were able to use our, our, our minds and our intelligence to do these things. And as a matter of fact, if you take a look at, uh, you know, what we call the four aspects of being, uh, our medicine wheel, we have uh, physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual. So intellectual is there as part of the aspect of what we're expected to develop. However, we also recognize that spirituality is a form of higher intelligence. And, you know, people sometimes say, well, you know, how can you apply that to chemistry? You know, if you go to chem if you go to university and take chemistry, well, you know, you just go to the classes, you study the textbooks, you memorize what you need to memorize, and you pass your tests, and you can get a degree, you can go and work and if you love chemistry, you can make chemicals, you can make a lot of money, all that type of thing. But what I say is, if it was indigenous chemistry, ask the questions. First of all, you know, would we be creating all of those chemicals that we've created? Chemicals that are poisoning people, chemicals that are poisoning the environment, chemicals that actually harm, or harm us, chemicals that we don't really know what, what, they're, really, what they're really for. You know, uh, chemicals that uh, by and large are often made simply for the purpose of making money. And so, you see, it's the wisdom that's lacking. In our tradition, we will go through ceremonial protocols. We would pray. We would ask the spirit world for guidance as to whether or not these things were necessary, whether they were good, what kind of consequences they would have for future generations. And if they weren't good, we wouldn't develop them. And we certainly wouldn't develop them just for, for profit. Uh, next slide. So I uh, actually went to, the, uh, went to the trouble of trying to figure out exactly where Indigenous Eden was. And of course, at one point, the whole world was Indigenous Eden. But uh, the point of this uh, particular exercise is to look at where Indigenous Eden was in 1492. And so in 1492, I describe Indigenous Eden as all the areas that remained outside of the Abrahamic religions. And so uh, the Abrahamic religions, of course, are those that embrace this concept of the idea that uh, 
you know, that humans, that there's a special, some kind of a special covenant between, um, between the creator and humans and that uh, creation was primarily for the purpose of human use and uh, that uh, somehow humans had the right to dominate and exploit the rest of creation. So to me, the um, pink part is the part which, uh, in which uh, you know, humans essentially have been kicked out of the Garden of Eden and the rest of the world was still uh, those parts which were indigenous or what I call in uh, this uh, particular thing, this was before I came up with a revised uh, title for it. At this point, I was calling it Indigenous and Weedigal Worlds. Weedigal, of course, being the place where humans uh, sort of went off the good path. But uh, I renamed these. Uh, I called uh, uh, I called the pink world, I call it civilization. And uh, in order to create a counterbalance and describe a name for Indigenous, uh, you see, because uh, historians like to term indigenous, ancient indigenous societies, like to call them indigenous civilizations. And of course, I reject the use of the word civilization because civilization in itself, if you take a look at the root, civil, civil itself, the term civil implies uh, a code of behavior between humans. So civilization, of course, is reflective of this type of ideology of, um, you know, this is like a, a, a for human only type of world. And so I created the term and I used that term in the um, Loss of Indigenous Eden book. I, I called it equalization. And equalization, um, you know, gives you the idea that there's a much larger system. It uh, implies a relationship with nature, but also the most important part, as I point out, the most important part of this bigger picture is the spirit world, because that's where we come from originally. And uh, that's the world to which we need to be con continue to be connected to if we're going to live properly. And so uh, in my book, uh, the green area would be what I call equalization and the uh, pink world would be what I would call civilization. So uh, we can move on to the next slide. So this is another uh, interesting uh, thing I found in my research because I, um, you know, I, I um, kind of um, got the impression that there was a bit of hanky-panky going on in terms of, you know, the portrayal of the rise of civilization. You know, people get, get the impression that, uh, you know, all of a sudden civilization rose 6,000 years ago and everybody was uh, embracing this. What I found, of course, is that uh, not everybody embraced civilization. You know, civilization was not essentially something that's been uh, imposed on, on populations around the world, essentially through force and conquest, especially by uh, the two um, primary um, indigenous um, um, religions, uh, Christianity and Islam, have been responsible for, uh, I would say, the vast majority of that uh, spread of this uh, idea of civilization. Uh, interesting enough, Judaism, which is often described as the uh, original Abrahamic religion, was not about um, uh, going out and conquering. Of course, that uh, concept came from Hellenism, you know, in the uh, Greek philosophy and that type of thing. So anyway, uh, so you know, the consensus is that modern humans have been around for 200,000 years ago. So I point out, you know, they say, you know, back, way back um, 200,000 years ago, they figured there was maybe like a core group of 15,000 individuals. So I say, of these 15,000, 100% of them were indigenous. And of course, um, you know, human population grows, it kind of goes through a bit of fits and starts at points. But, uh, you know, by uh, 6,000, uh, BCE, which is when, uh, you know, like uh, civilization kind of got traction. Of course, we know that, you know, there are little uh, dibs and dribs and drabs of civilization kind of appearing, uh, you know, like even earlier than that. But essentially, you know, a lot of people say, well, civilization essentially started around 6,000 uh, years ago. And um, it uh, was centered in this uh, place called Ur, which was a city in Samaria. And the uh, city of Ur was approximately 80,000 people. And so, uh, you know, like it's interesting, I find that, uh, you know, the population of 80,000 was also the population of Rome when it began to uh, sort of go out and conquer and exploit its neighbors. But uh, so I put here that, uh, so let's say 6,000 BCE, you know, uh, this 80,000 again civilization is often seems to be connected with, uh, you know, the rise of these urban centers. So 80,000 were, um, civilized 
and uh, 11 million 920,000 were um, essentially indigenous. So if you do the math, that really makes it uh, that the world was still overwhelmingly indigenous at that point in 6,000 BCE, out of a world po estimated world population of 12 million people, of course, of whom nobody talks about, right, because they weren't civilized. Okay, so let's go to 1492 again, an world, estimated world population of 550 million. And uh, the, um, so uh, in this estimate, uh, I basically took a, a world population of the Abrahamic uh, religions of roughly 60 million people. And even there, not all of that 60 million was actually um, uh, civilized, so to speak. You know, like the Celts, for example, people like that were not what you might call civilized. And so, um, <clears throat> the uh, Abrahamic population at that time would have been about 11%. And so I point out that 89% of people in 1492 were still indigenous. And so where's the turning point? Well, interesting enough, the turning point is around the 1820s. And the 1820s are kind of a pivotal year. There's a number of things happening. One of them, of course, is that this is when non-indigenous people begin to outnumber indigenous people in the world. It's also a time I talked about, uh, you know, the rise of the um, age of reason and the, in, the industrial age, the explosion of transportation technology, explosion of uh, military technology, um, world trade. Uh, all of these things were kind of uh, coming together in the 1820s. And of course, this was the time in which, uh, you know, the vast parts of North America were still indigenous and in South America. And uh, so it's interesting that non-Indigenous people have only been the majority of world population uh, in the last 200 years. And of course, uh, you know, we kind of get the impression today, right, that civilization has always been around, right? And of course, we, you know, uh, we've seen shrinking number of, of Indigenous people today. Uh, the number of, uh, you know, what they call uh, uh, Indigenous people for all intents and purposes, 5%. Although that number can be parsed more um, you know, uh, actually, I would argue that uh, the number, uh, you know, could be actually described as being higher than that. But uh, in all, for all functional purposes, uh, you know, those who are uh, still practicing a sort of or has, still have a connection with their Indigenous culture, a strong connection, would be um, um, summarized as being 5% of today's population. And of course, uh, that number continues to, uh, to dwindle. So uh, next slide. Okay, so I'm uh, getting close to the end of my presentation. I don't know how my time is going, but, but um, uh, <clears throat> just some uh, things to uh, leave you with. Uh, again, I mentioned that, uh, you know, humans have been around on the earth for 200,000 years. And uh, I, I uh, contend that indigenous spirituality was, was a very intimate um, respect and connection. Relationship with nature has been practiced since the advent of modern humans on earth 200,000 years ago. So, you know, this is something I think we, need, think we need to correct that, you know, people since the dawn of humanity were indigenous, not primitive. Okay, again, civilization, this is uh, a key point in my argument about loss of indigenous even. It's also going to be a further key point in the next book, which I um, am uh, actually started working on. It's uh, tentatively titled uh, Challenging Civilization and, uh, you know, basically saying that uh, you know, I'm a, a proud uncivilized person, right? Uh, because I, you know, I um, question civilization and I have a respect for nature and so on and so forth. But civilization again is defined as the rising up against and conquering of nature. It's uh, essentially from, uh, from what the elders told me and from looking at uh, what happened in the rise of civilization, it was definitely a rejection of indigenous values of, um, of, um, being thankful for nature, of respecting nature, of not being afraid of nature because it was nature is benevolent as the cradle is benevolent, of not uh, resorting to the hoarding of plants and animals, which basically are characteristic of uh, the beginnings of civilization, agriculture and that type of thing. And also, uh, interesting enough, the rise of, uh, of military conflicts and wars, which uh, is also another characteristic of, uh, which is identified with the so-called rise of civilization. So again, we recognize the reality of spirit and we also recognize the presence of spirit in all creative things, that these, uh, all of these beings have a right to exist on their own terms. And uh, we actually, in our prayers, 
uh, we actually refer to them as uh, as spiritual altars. And when I said the prayer at the beginning of the session, when I talked about the name of all the altars, that's what I was talking about. I wasn't talking about my my immediate family. I was actually talking about our existence in the entirety of creation, and that we need to treat all of creation with respect and to be responsible as stewards, which is uh, which is part of our original instructions. Again, civilization has existed for only the last 3% of human experience, but equalizations have existed for 97% of that time and are far more stable. And, you know, everybody brags about how the Roman Empire lasted for a thousand years. Well, I would argue that uh, indigenous equalizations were far more stable in that they would, you know, simply uh, put the Roman Empire to shame in terms of the longevity. Now, I've, in uh, uh, my book, um, Loss of Indigenous Eden, I actually call universities, universities of civilization. And uh, I argue that uh, one of the greatest mistakes of historians and everybody basically who talks about civilization is that they always talk about the human experience as having started 6,000 years ago with civil, rise of civilization. And uh, you know, they say, oh, this is when we started to think for ourselves, right? This is when we started to create art. This is when we started to do this and that and showing how great we are as humans. Well, that was part of the problem, of course, you know, and it's led to the situation where, where we think that we're the end all and be all. We think that we're God's perfect creation and that, you know, everything is here at our, our disposal. And, uh, you know, we have forgotten our humility. We've forgotten our respect. And uh, because we have lost all of that, you know, this is, this is the kind of uh, thing that's gotten to us, gotten us to the situation where we are and in particular where we've gotten in the last 200 years since non-Indigenous people have been the majority. And, um, you know, we really need to shake, shake our heads. We need to get out of this box of thinking, this box, this mental box that civilization has put us in. You know, people are saying, you know, we need to rethink. We need to have, come up with a new paradigm. And I simply tell people, you know, the paradigm that we need is there. It's, it's always been there. The, it's the paradigm that Indigenous people had and continue to have. But, um, you know, I find that whenever I talk about that, especially when I, um, um, you know, if you talk about that in the general public, you know, the idea of Indigenous spirituality and what, it, what the implications are, they're very threatened because, uh, you know, to betray, to, to um, get, get out of that uh, paradigm, it threatens very much almost all of what we value in today's society with exploitation of nature and, you know, the uh, building of wealth based on money and, uh, you know, like the, uh, you know, wars and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, but what I say in terms of equalization is, you know, we need to take, we can't, we can't go back to the way we were 10,000 years ago. We need to take civilization and we need to apply uh, the indigenous knowledge and spirituality and we need to take that, take what was created in civilization, get rid of what, what all of those things that were bad and uh, slowly transform that even if it takes centuries and, and millennia. We need to transform it to what I would call an, an advanced equalization, one which in which um, there is uh, advanced technology and all this type of thing, but uh, which is also governed by, uh, by, by spirituality as we uh, indigenous people understand it. Again, just to repeat uh, what I said before about non-indigenous people only become the majority of the world in the, pop, the pivotal age of the 1820s, mere 200 years ago. And I'll just close off with another interesting tidbit, which I think is uh, not only interesting, but I think important in terms of our current situation. So, you know, if you take a look at the experience of, um, evolutionary experience of those species which are closest to us, which of course are simians, you know, whether you call them um, monkeys or apes, um, you know, take a look at what, what is the lifespan of these, uh, these living beings. Well, the average uh, expectancy for them to be on Earth is a million years. And, um, you know, we think we're so intelligent that, uh, you know, we're going to, you know, it's not going to be, it's going to be a breeze for us, right, to outland these, outlast these uh, other stupid animals, you know, because we're so clever, right? We're so capable of, uh, of manipulating our environment and uh, adapting all that kind of stuff. Well, I'll simply point out that if we're going to if we're going to rival these other species, we only have another eight hundred thousand years to go to before we reach what they've they've achieved. So how are we going to do that? Of course, that's the obvious answer. 
how are we going to live another, how are we going to last another 100,000, 800,000 years, especially when some people are starting to question whether 800 years is even feasible anymore in terms of uh, entertaining the, uh, the future of hum humanity. So uh, I will simply uh, leave that uh, with everybody as a, um, you know, as a sort of a, a last footnote to this uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Blair. Hi, hi. This was very excellent. Um, so now we're at a point where um, we'll be opening up the, um, the floor to questions. So I will be your moderator for today. So Blair will give him a little break <laughs> so he can just like breathe. It was an excellent presentation. And um, it's like I, we, we learn a lot by hearing and experiencing this and like, so um, it's like step by step. It's like, yeah, we're unpacking the impact of how civilization, you know, implants itself all over these indigenous territories, right? So, so it's a really good initiative and thank you very much for it. So I'll open up the floor. We will start with, um, so I will call your, your name. You can unmute your, your mic and then Blair will respond, okay? So we'll talk, we'll start with uh, Bertha Yetman. Bertha? Mm -hmm. Perfect, we can hear you. Oh, your mic is, uh, you're back off. You put mute again. I think that was my fault, I'm so sorry. Oh, there okay. you go. Gotcha. Okay, you hear me. I hear you, you for sure. Thank you uh, for a very fine presentation, Blair. Uh, I, uh, I have some history. Uh, I, I was born and raised in rural Newfoundland fishing community and the fisheries has been destroyed, of course, uh, because of exploitation and the con colonial conquering notion of um, which, which I've done research on. I lived in Northern Canada. I taught there. Uh, in Labrador and northern Manitoba. I, uh, I am interested, it, it, I, I thank you for your kindness in mentioning about the residential, calling them reform schools. Uh, growing up in rural, I, I'm looking at the commonalities here of being a rural Newfoundlander, growing up in my childhood without lights, without telephones, without indoor plumbing, any of that, and uh, it was a small boat fishery. I was taught by a religious order uh, in a four-room school, but the notion was that you would even hide the fact that your father was a fisherman. It was, it was to be uh, something to be ashamed of. Have you ever uh, uh, observed uh, from from the smaller, more isolated rural areas, how uh, there are commonalities that do exist between different peoples. Even and and I don't come from the indigenous, except that we were a settler people, uh, probably with, with not as favorable a history as as uh, some of the dominant or outside ones would consider. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think that, uh, of course, um, you know, indigenous societies tended to be small, right? Mind you, the Aztecs and Mayans were large societies, which uh, also, can, you know, managed to retain uh, a lot of the um, indigenous values. You know, I wouldn't call them civilizations, despite the way that you know, Europeans like to describe them. I would describe them as advanced civilizations, but I would say that essentially, um, you know, this phenomenon of uh, urbanization really sense, seems to lend itself to, the, you know, to, to civilization. And, um, uh, you know, I think that applies not only uh, in North America, it also applies to Europe. You know, that the, you see, to me, civilization is, is grounded in primarily two things. N number one is wealth. That, that's, that's the primary foundation. Second one is power. If you take a look at all these civilizations, they have to have a lot of wealth and power and they go around getting their wealth by essentially by conquering and taking other people's lands and that type of thing. And so, you know, they, through that they gain this power. And of course, 
uh, in smaller communities, um, you know, the, both the wealth and power are not, uh, you know, that's not where they're centered. And so people there tend not to, you know, to have uh, so much uh, uh, affinity to, you know, to these uh, elements of uh, what you might call civilization. But, um, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a curious uh, phenomenon. I think uh, one of the things, one of the ways I would look at that is, um, and when I did my research, um, you know, I, I, I Googled this thing about uh, what's the ideal population, what's the ideal population, human population on earth. And they say the, the ideal uh, population is 1.5 to 2 million for the entire, billion, sorry, for the entire earth. And so when was the last time that that existed? Well, interestingly enough, the last time that that existed was in the 1820s. That's when the last time that when the world's population was in that area of 1.2 to 2 billion. Of course, look what's happening now, right? It's almost 8 billion, right? Just in the last 200, 200 years. But if you take that uh, 1.5 to 2 billion, that would not have room for megacities, for example, right? You know, we have, how many megacities do we have in the world now, right? Of 10 million people and more, right? There's probably 20, maybe 30 already of these megacities and it's gonna get even more. So if you have, uh, you know, like a population like that, what, what that essentially implies is that um, there's uh, like for the, uh, the um, optimal population, it implies a healthy relationship between yourself, between the humans and the rest of their natural environment. That's what it implies. Mind you, I should, um, I should uh, point out that there's usually a debate. There's usually two versions of this, uh, this idea of um, optimal population. Uh, one version of optimal population says that it's basically the point at which there's a balance between yourself and the natural environment, right? So this is a type of, of um, definition that would go with indigenous people, right? Because indigenous people did not believe that we should be imposing ourselves on the natural environment, right? So whatever the natural, whatever limitations the natural environment gave, um, you know, that would be, a, that would be an optimal population, of course, unless there were spiritual ways to to do things which would enable, you know, the population to grow without impinging on nat nature. But um, the other uh, argument about optimal population is basically uh, whatever the traffic will bear. So, you know, so economists will say, well, what we have today is optimal population because we have 8 billion people, you know, we're able to support it economically, right? We're able to produce the food. We're able to, um, you know, have all the technology. We're still not you know, like uh, blowing each other with uh, with atomic bombs and stuff like that. So, you know, it's it's whatever the traffic will bear, right? If we can find ways to farm enough vegetables and slaughter enough uh, farm animals and so on and so forth, and we can sustain a population of eight million, well, good for us. That's 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 what many economists uh, call today optimal population. So, um, you know, that's my answer. Uh, you know, I think uh, I think that. Um, large population centers, I guess, to be, to be biased about it, I think that large population centers are artificial and, uh, you know, they're not natural and they're not spiritual. It, it, it's a, thank you so much, but it's interesting when I grew up just as a little, entity, you know, that, um, uh, you know, rural Newfoundland were small boats hook and line fishery, all of this. Uh, 50 years inside of Confederation joining Canada and the fish are gone. The big offshore factory freezer trawlers, draggers just exploited and plundered the whole fishery. 40,000 people were left unemployed and having to go elsewhere, leave their familiar society and culture and go somewhere else and apply their skills elsewhere. This seems to be a rather, this is a rather shocking uh, fact of our current history. Well, I'd simply comment, uh, do you think indigenous people would have done that? You know, like uh, they say when European fishermen came to, to uh, yeah. Newfoundland, they, you know, they could literally put a bucket in the water and they come up with a bucket of fish, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's the same thing all over, I know here in the prairies, they yeah. say that, uh, you know, you could walk out of your house and you'd see deer, you'd see moose, you'd see yeah. elk, you would see um, lots of stuff. You'd see bears, you would see 
for us, it, most people, you know. It's because we respected, we respected yeah. the other beings, right? And we did not, mm -hmm. you know, like we, you know, we didn't exploit them. That's, of course, the, you know, when I mentioned, I didn't mention, of course, bison, right? Which were here in the, in the um, you know, many millions. And mm -hmm. so, you know, what, what, what uh, indigenous people had when uh, Europeans came here, we had, we had land which, which we were stewards of, right? We were living in the Garden of Eden. And um, of course, uh, when Europeans came here, they said, well, aren't these people stupid? Right? Aren't these people stupid? Yeah. You know, they're, not, they're not exploiting all these resources. Well, all I can say is that, you know, we, were, we had the strategy that would allow us to exist for 800,000, another 800,000 years. That was our strategy. We were in for, for, for the long run. Right? Mm -hmm. For us, it was only 500 years, but yeah. we still did well. 50 years of colonial, uh, of uh, confederation, contro uh, you know, Ottawa control, and virtually everything is just about destroyed. And maybe another 500 years if we're lucky, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. I like the connection between empire and how Indigenous make treaty with different peoples, right? So like, like thinking about the Mi'kmaq right now and the treaty fisheries and what's going on, right? It's like yeah. really relevant to this talk. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much, Bertha, for that really excellent question. Um, I'm going to move to uh, Pat Dold, Patricia, uh, for her amazing question. <laughs> it better be. No, my, my amazing question. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Blair, for this talk. And I, I, uh, I was intrigued by many, many things. I think it's really, uh, but I really appreciate the work that you've done to, you know, just that, that makes someone like me look at, you know, civilization and the whole, you know, all of these, like, I mean, the whole, you know, depth and breadth of human history, really, you have, you've, you've been quite ambitious in your scope, um, which is great, uh, because it, 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 it gives us an opportunity to, you know, look at, at very, things that we thought we knew about, um, but look at them in an entirely different way. Uh, so I, I'm interested in the, in the, you know, the distinction that you're setting up between um, indigenous peoples and cultures and equalizations, as you've called them, and uh, civilizations. Um, I did wonder because my my one of my major areas of research is Asian uh, religious traditions, and so I wondered. Um, if you or the sources that you were looking at on sort of the rise of human civilization, if uh, you or your sources uh, had a category for sort of non-Abrahamic, non-Greco-Roman uh, civilizations. So the, the two that came to my mind immediately were like the Han Chinese, the Mauryans in South Asia, um, which, you know, whose ideologies were not were about empire and they certainly were, you know, expanding their realm of influence beyond their original homelands, as it were. Anyway, I'll leave the question there for you. It's an excellent question. I'm glad you asked it. And, um, you know, I um, tend to uh, uh, view this uh, application of the term civilization to everywhere, you know, including China and India and stuff like that, you know, like I view that as a form of uh, intellectual imperialism. Uh, and um, that's a question that I had to tackle when I was doing the research on loss of indigenous Eden, because I had also had to account for that, right? And the way I, I did it, I, the way I would answer that question is number one to say that um, at, one, at, at one point, for example, China and India and all these places, uh, outside of uh, the Abrahamic religions were essentially indigenous, right? And you can tell, like, for example, if you take, in China, you take Taoism. Taoism is very distinctly and definitely, there's no question that it's an indigenous religion because spirit, you know, belief system, because it's based on relationship with nature. So there's no, there's no question that Taoism is definitely indigenous. It's been overtaken by Confucianism, which is very different. Confucianism is a lot more like Abrahamic religions, right? It's based on a much more 
human-centered type of way of looking at things. Uh, and it's kind of uh, pushed Taoism aside. But uh, what I would say is if you take a look, for example, at China, just to give China as an example, uh, there's still very many elements that you can see in indigenous, of indigenous beliefs, for example, respect for ancestors, right? You know, um, now, uh, if you take a look at uh, um, China, like I would say, first of all, that China is not perfect, just like no other indigenous place is perfect. China had very large populations, right? If you take a look at their history, there are a lot of internal wars and that type of thing. Uh, and there was, of course, um, you know, expansion of certain groups which dominated China, right? But they didn't really move much beyond the world, like not like, for example, uh, Christianity and Islam, you know, they didn't, you know, mind you, you have, you have Genghis Khan who's kind of an exception to that, right? But, uh, you know, it's interesting because Genghis, Genghis Khan, they say when they asked him why he did it, he says, well, I don't really know. <laughs> You know, I mean, he was, I don't know, I think, I, I, I mean, I don't know what was up with Genghis Khan, but he didn't seem to be inspired by, by a religious motive like the uh, Abrahamic religions were. But um, <clears throat> to me, uh, a real turning point uh, in terms of China was the Opium Wars. You know, again, that was the eight, early 1800s, right? And um, if you take a look at China before the Opium Wars, it was very much a, 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 like a, an agrarian society. So when the British and other Europeans came in during the Opium Wars and essentially conquered China, right? What did China have to do? And what does China continue to have to do? What do many of these countries who I would say were originally indigenous, what do they have to do when, when uh, European, um, uh, Europeans came there and they started coming with their gunships and they started taking over these lands? What do they have to do? They had to respond by building their own militaries. They had to respond by building their own capitalist economies, simply to counter what, what Europeans were doing and to counter European power. They had to begin recreating themselves to look more like the European countries that were, that were oppressing them, simply to survive on their own. That's, that's why I say, you know, that's why I say that uh, I would call China, I have various terms, terms for it, I would call it uh, uh, an advanced equalization because it was developing technology, but to me it was still very much like an indigenous type of, of, um, of, um, of uh, society. At the same time, I would also call it, it's moving more what I call a passive civilization. And uh, I'll be talking about these distinctions in my next book. Uh, to me, an aggressive civilization is one where there's no question the purpose of that civilization is to amass power and wealth and to go around take, oppressing other countries, taking other, conquering other countries, taking resources, you know, and that's what's happened with Britain, for example, um, you know, with uh, all of these European countries that the Spanish, these were what I call aggr aggressive civilizations. Now, what I would call a passive civilization, I would call a passive civilization that's had to become more human centered, has had, had to devote much more attention to uh, amassing wealth developing its economies at the expense of the natural world, building a military simply to preserve its own, its own um, um, survival in the face of uh, aggressive civilizations, right? So they're, I call them a passive civilization because they've adopted many more characters of civilization, but they haven't done it really because they are that, uh, 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 you know, because power and money and dominating other parts of the world is their priority, but it's simply for a matter of self-survival. Now, it's interesting because China is on the cusp of overtaking the United States as being the wealthiest country in the world, right? And I think, um, you know, when you take a look at the, uh, the political situation in the United States, it's, 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 um, it's, it's, it's patently obvious that the Chinese are far more po powerful in terms of being able to move their people as a group, right? To create immense wealth in the matter of a few decades. You know, when they can do that, they can, I, I think that, you know, they could easily overwhelm the, the United States as the world power within a matter of, uh, of a few decades. And of course, the United States is all afraid of it, right? They're saying, well, you know, they're going to come and force Chinese on us and they're going to this and that. But you know what? The Americans are simply projecting their own nightmare on other people's, right? They're saying, well, we did it to indigenous people here. And so somebody's going to come and do it to us. But I, I think that, uh, like I say, I don't think, I, I think it's unfair to to, uh, you know, at least in my analysis of history and what's happened, you know, uh, the way I would place uh, Asian cultures is that I would say that they were primarily 
uh, they weren't what I call incipient equalizations like I would call, for example, North American tribes and other people that are still very cl closely connected to, to uh, nature. I would call those incipient equalizations. They're still very connected to uh, nature. You know, they haven't really developed a lot of technologies and that type of thing. Uh, but I would say that China and a lot of these other places are what we call advanced equalizations. They were developing technologies, but they were still somewhat in reasonable balance with nature and they had not adopted um, wholesale this idea that, you know, we're human beings and we have the right to dominate everything and exploit it and we're going to go and fight our neighbors and take their land just to prove that we're better than them, you know. Yeah. But it's, 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 a tough, it's a tough thing to explain, you know. It's a tough thing to explain uh, because I think that European academics have really tried to, they've gone out of the way to try and portray everybody in the world as being the same as them. They try to, they try to call ancient indigenous people, first of all, if they don't call them primitive cavemen, then they say they're, they're Mayan or Aztec civilizations. But these, place, these places are not being properly um, portrayed. They were not what in my mind are civilizations at all. And then of course they go around talking about, you see, everything is civilization, right? And it's, it's this whole thing that nothing mattered until humans started to, you know, uh, make everything about themselves. Mm -hmm. So is that good, Patricia? Yes, thank you. Thanks, Pat. Good. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, the next uh, questioner is Mary Beth White. She has uh, another question. And then we have, after that, Sarah Wilkins Laflamme. There's Mary Beth. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi. Uh, I think really in many ways, Blair, I thank you very much. I think you've answered the question. It was really uh, Patricia's question that then I was kind of jumping on. I just wasn't clear on how you were defining um, kind of civilizations. I understood that they were more of a contract between human beings that kind of neglected the natural world. Um, so I was just curious, and I, I think you're teasing it out now with this passive and aggressive civilizations as well, because certainly under Confucian, there was uh, quite a structured civil understanding of your place in society. So I see a lot of that in Asia as well. So I was, I was a bit confused. So, um, but I thank you for your presentation. If you want to speak a bit further on that, but I think you've covered it and uh, I definitely see your main point that uh, since enlightenment, there's been anything but uh, enlightenment and, um, and the natural world has definitely taken a beating under uh, Christian, Judaic, Islamic kind of understandings of, of the world, sadly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, the only comment I would make is that, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I use the term equalization and of course you get this idea, you know, we have to respect nature and all that business, right? And of course, um, you know, we respect each other because we're all children of the creator, so to speak, you know. However, I think that um, in equalization, people often miss the most important relationship of all, which is the spiritual relationship, you know. And uh, that's, what, that's what I was taught. That's what my understanding in terms of indigenous uh, societies or equalization are, is that the, the relationship with spirit is the number one relationship. It's the most important relationship of all. It's more important than the relationship with nature. And uh, because it's our source, it's our source of understanding, whether it's done through dreams or visions or prayers or whatever, meditation, we come back with the same message, which is that, you know, who we are, how we're supposed to behave here. And if we lose sight of that, well then, you know, if you lose sight of that, you're gonna end up exploiting, you're, you're gonna end up having bad relationships with, with the natural world because you've lost that respect you know, you've lost that respect for spirit. Uh, you've lost that respect for us as our, you know, as our higher calling, so to speak. And so uh, that's the only comment I would make in terms of the use of equalization is that people don't get that the most important part of equalization is having a strong relationship with the spirit, spirit or whatever you want to call it. Thank you, Blair. Thanks, Mary Beth. Good job. Now, uh, <laughs> it's time for Sarah Wilkins, La Flamme. Thanks, Paul. Uh, thanks, Blair. That was a really fascinating talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, I guess my question is following up a bit on Pat's and Mary Beth's and trying to un kind of unpack these, these concepts of e equalization, civilization. So 
would it be fair to say, like, could you see it along a spectrum rather than a binary? So some societies are fully within the equalization, some societies are fully with, uh, in what you call aggressive civilization, and then there might be a kind of, that kind of middle ground space along a spectrum in between, or is that not a good way of seeing it? No, that's exactly the way I'm uh, working on conceptualizing it. So, you know, if we, let's say, have on the left side just as an argument where it starts, right? So there you would have uh, what I'll call um, the incipient, equal, incipient equalizations. These are like, for example, um, groups, indigenous groups are still very close to nature, right? They don't have a lot of technology, right? They still almost depend 100% on, on the natural technology. But I mean, they can, they can obviously manipulate things, right? You know, like making weapon, you know, spears or whatever, fish traps, uh, all of these kind of things. But uh, I would say that uh, in uh, incipient, uh, uh, incipient uh, equalizations, a lot of these things that are developed in terms of technology have been things that have been, come, have been developed by virtue of uh, some sort of a spiritual protocol. So, you know, even if you take a look at, uh, you know, like uh, spears or whatever arrows that were developed a long time ago, you know, right away when you take a look at, at uh, Anthropologists, archaeologists will say, well, look at this, they're getting ready to be violent, right? You know, they're, you know, one of the arguments about the um, disappearance of, um, of uh, animals, uh, you know, thousands of years ago, they say, well, look at these indigenous people, right? They're just ruthless, right? They went and slaughtered the whole lot of them. That, that's why they disappeared, which of course is not, not, not at all. You know, they would have to have gone on a massive uh, campaign of slaughter in order to do that. And of course, if they respected these animals and viewed them as gifts from the crater to be used, why would it, you know, it just goes against the whole grain of their thinking that they would do that. So, you know, these uh, incipient equalizations, I would say, as uh, Mush and Danny would say, you know, these are um, uh, uh, societies where the emphasis is still very much on, uh, on the um, original um, um, values of being humble for, you know, being thankful for being in the physical earth, for being humble in front of the creator, uh, thankful. But also, uh, as uh, Mush and Danny explained, you know, it's like, for example, if you have a newborn, if you have a newborn, that newborn has to spend some time just getting to know how to manage its physical body, right? You know, and that to me, that's what, that's what, if you take a look at the whole scope of a hundred of a million years experience, if you compare it to a person who lives for a for, uh, for hundred years, the first 200,000 years is like being a, like a 20 year old, right? Developing a 20 year old, right? So to me, that's, that's the way humanity should have been developing for going along that trajectory, you know? So, you know, the, the, those cultures were basically learning how to um, live within these physical bodies, how to, be, how to live within their environments in a respectful and proper way. But, uh, you know, using that analogy, what we have now is we have a humanity who's a 20 year old who doesn't respect anything that they've got and they're busy destroying it as fast as they can, right? That's, that's kind of like where we've ended up in that in that comparison. So, you know, as a wise 20 year old, you know, indigenous people in an incipient equalization would have been just at the stage where they were beginning to um, mature in terms of their intellectual ability. And uh, so that's where I come to advanced equalizations. You know, like these are, for example, if you take a look at China and India, well, and to an extent the Americas too, because we were developing very quite sophisticated, um, you know, like in <coughs> the Aztec and Mayan worlds, we were developing quite sophisticated uh, mathematics and astronomy and uh, certainly agriculture and, um, um, uh, you know, uh, temples and all that type of thing, architecture. But we still did not, our, our um, intellectual understanding had not developed to the point where we understood, for example, things like earthquakes and volcanoes. And I argue, for example, I went to a conference and there was a, an a elder who was talking about the Aztecs and how they had human human sacrifice and how when the uh, Spanish came there and they said, well, this is an example, this is a reason to destroy this because they're obviously under the influence of the devil, right, they're evil. And what he said, he said, the Aztec elders had warned the Aztec leaders that if they did not stop human sacrifice, that their civilization would come to an end, it would be destroyed. And it's interesting that, uh, you know, the, uh, the Aztecs uh, at that time, of course, they're God of knowledge, uh, Quetzalcoatl, had been in exile. You know, there had been a, a problem, right? And so their God of knowledge was in exile. And they were expecting him to return. And ironically, it was, it was expected to return at the time that uh, 
that Cortez landed, landed, right? And so, you know, if you take a look at the historical records, right, they say the Aztecs initially thought that Cortez was the arrival of, of, of uh, the God of Knowledge, Quetzalcoatl. And of course, the God of Knowledge would not have countenanced uh, human sacrifice. Uh, human sacrifice was basically done out of fear. It was done, you know, like because they, they thought that, uh, you know, the, um, if they did not uh, uh, do human sacrifice, you know, that the sun would not rise, right, that the earth would be destroyed. So they had to keep on appeasing, you know, these uh, terrible gods of nature through human sacrifice. And uh, so it was a spiritual exercise, you know, to put it in a nutshell. Human sacrifice was not barbarity. It was actually the sacrificing of what was most important to humans themselves, right, which was human life itself. So, um, you know, the, um, so, you know, this um, shows that uh, while, you know, advanced equalizations like the Aztecs were developing some knowledge, they were far from having the intellectual knowledge that we have today in terms of, uh, you know, like understanding the, the science behind the environment or the science behind the, the um, uh, you know, like advanced technologies and that type of thing. But, you know, when you take a look at what's been developed in terms of today's sciences and technology, I mean, a lot of the uh, understanding of the, of the environment is because they want companies, companies want to go out there and exploit it, right? You know, we'll do an environment, we'll do an environmental assessment and we'll go there and dig everything up, right? Uh, a lot of the technology we develop has been developed because of warfare, you know, the needs of warfare, right? You need better communications, right? You need faster vehicles, right? You need whatever. And so uh, what I say is that the, the problem with modern technology is that they've been developed in an unspiritual way. They've been developed simply because of the, uh, you know, machinations of civilization, power and money and that type of thing, right? That's how, the, that's how our, our uh, contemporary, uh, you know, all this so-called knowledge that we flaunt as being so great, that's how it was developed. Indigenous people would develop, eventually develop all of that knowledge of all of that technology and all that science, but they would have done it in a spiritual way and they would have, they wouldn't have, you know, it would have been probably taken maybe another 10, 20,000, who knows how many years. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, the peak of our human civilization should have occurred about 500,000 years into our trajectory, right? If we're to last a million years, not, not at 200,000 years, right? So, um, you know, so in terms of that spectrum, uh, you know, so I go from incipient uh, equalization, which are still very, very close to nature, you know, they're still following what, you, what we call the original instructions of the creator. Then you go into what I call advanced equalization. So these are, you know, like they're, they're, they're starting to use uh, their knowledge of things to develop, you know, whether it's, uh, whether it's in um, architecture or astronomy or agriculture, but they are still indigenous civilizations, they still believe in the same fundamental principles, which is that we're not at the top of the heap, right? They, they still have the ceremonies. You can tell they have the ceremonies. That was the preoccupation of the Aztecs and Mayans. They spent as much time in ceremonies as people on the, on the plains did. So that's an advanced equalization. So you start getting to um, what I call, um, I guess I start from the other, other end of the spectrum just for argument, which is the aggressive civilization becomes, because they become very obvious, right? You know, like the, um, you know, uh, it's, it starts uh, primarily with the Greeks and Romans, right? They become the most, uh, you know, aggressive of these. I mean, the, the thinking about uh, civilization begins in dribs and drabs. You see it among the Sumerians and the Egyptians and that type of thing. You start to see them in, in, in introducing more and more of uh, human elements into their spirituality, right? The Romans and their gods that look like humans and that type of thing. But then you get the marriage of, uh, you see, like to me, I, interesting enough, I view the, I view Christ and the original uh, Christi Christianity, I view it as, um, as a type of indigenous uh, spirituality. You know, it didn't really talk about nature a lot, but to me, a lot of the values were very much indigenous. But then you get the co-opting by the uh, Roman Empire, right? You get the marriage of, of uh, Christianity and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Roman barbarity, and then you really have something that's going to rock the boat, right? And that's that's what leads to this uh, interesting religion, which uh, justifies, you know, which justified the conquest of indigenous peoples in the Americas because they were considered considered to be subhuman and and uh, so on and so forth, right? And uh, you know, the pretense of uh, of uh, converting this converting souls while essentially taking their um, taking their gold at the point of a sword, and uh, so 
you know, those aggressive civilizations. Unfortunately, see, we historians love to talk about these guys as great heroes, right? Great heroes of civilization, Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar. You can't get enough of them, right? They're just so wonderful and powerful. But they, and they're the ones who primarily, they, they created the template for the spread of civilization. They're the one, you know, uh, Mussolini, you know, I mean, if you want to see the depravities of civilization, look at he, Mussolini who was trying to re resurrect the glories of the Roman Empire. Look at, look at, uh, Hitler, right, who was trying to resurrect the Holy Roman Empire, right? It's all about power and money. And if you can, it doesn't matter how many people you destroy, as long as you end up with the power and money, glory to you, right? You're, you're the paragon of civilization. And uh, so to me, I start from that, and that's the, that's the aggressive civilization. But to me, many of these advanced equalizations have been forced to become what I call passive civilizations, right? They've had to focus on wealth making. They had to focus on, on protecting you know, protecting their countries by building militaries, just just to just to just to ward off European aggressors and colonizers. So they become they become um, uh, passive civilizations because they've had to take on the trappings of uh, of the aggressive civilization simply in order to preserve you know their own uh, territorial um, uh, and uh, national uh, uh, integrity. So, you know, I mean, where's the middle point? You know, I would say that the middle point would be that point at which, um, um, I guess, uh, you know, like I talk in my book, uh, the actual uh, complete title book will be um, Challenging Civilization. And uh, the subtitle is uh, um, Equalization and the New Indigeneity. And I talk about the New Indigeneity as a point at which, uh, you know, with the help of, of non-Indigenous allies, because Indigenous people are, totally powerless, right, to do anything today. All we have essentially is our spirituality and our, our philosophy. But we can hopefully, um, you know, I, I say that uh, since uh, non-Indigenous people have only been the majority in the last 200 years, I say they still have a, they still have um, a genetic memory of their indigeneity, right? And there are people who are prepared to be our allies, you know, people who are in mainstream society who can you know, people like educators, you know, people who can assume positions of power, right? And they can, um, you know, they can, uh, they can, uh, uh, they, they can recognize the value and importance and criticalness of Indigenous knowledge and the way it needs to be applied to, in order to, you know, start to right the ship. And um, so uh, the new Indigeneity would be one in which uh, uh, there's, um, number one, a recognition that uh, it was wrong to, uh, you know, to sideline and destroy and ridicule indigenous spirituality, that it's still relevant and that it's still, you know, it's, it's actually imperative for people to, uh, to learn about it in order to get out of this box, this mental box we're in. And um, by uh, doing that, uh, we can actually take, you know, if, if, if we, um, you know, can get enough people to do that, uh, you know, we can actually um, uh, use our indigeneity to uh, review the things that have been created under the contemporary model of civilization and get rid of the ones that are bad, keep the ones that are good, right? So get rid of, uh, you know, the weapons of mass destruction, get rid of the toxic chemicals, all that kind of stuff, right? And, you know, uh, remember that we have some spiritual responsibility. Remember that we have responsibility to nature. Remember that we have future generations, you know, we believe in reincarnation. And interesting enough, future generations actually will probably be, uh, it would actually be another variation of ourselves, you know? And um, so, do I think it's possible? Well, I guess the chances, I know I'm kind of, if I were gambling mine, I, I wouldn't throw my money on it. You know, it's maybe, you know, uh, I, my odds right now are probably one in a million, but uh, I guess we got to do it, right? Yep. We got to give it a chance. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right on. Thanks, Blair. This was really excellent. Um, we've, uh, we've run out of time, unfortunately. Uh, it's been a, a really excellent uh, um, opportunity to hear your to hear you talk through your book and your ideas and to center relations in in how we see the world right and how we can understand our history as you know western thinkers and peoples right so thank you very much blair okay, well hopefully you'll invite me back sometime oh tomorrow anytime <laughs> tomorrow <laughs> no it was a pleasure and uh thank you very everyone for uh, for listening yeah. And I'll pass it over to Sarah so she can uh, wrap up.
Yeah, yeah thanks, thanks again. Thanks again, Blair. That was so great. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say a quick word before we all head out. Uh, our next webinar, so again, this was our first for the fall. We've got a second one coming up at the end of October on the 29th. I believe that's the Thursday at 3, at 3 p.m. Eastern. And uh, this will be a series of presentations on the theme of understanding and combating hatred and violence through religious literacy and the law. It's going to be a webinar chaired by Catherine Holtman and presentations given by Alicia, uh, Megan and Maxwell. So I hope you all uh, join us for that one as well. I see, I think uh, on the Google form, I saw that some of you are already signed up. So that's great. Um, if you do want to register for the second and as well as our third webinar, which will be in November, uh, it's always that same Google form. I've put the link down here. It's in the poster. We'll be sending around this poster as well. It's always that same Google form. So if you haven't already, just go. It takes a few minutes. Just click that you want to attend the webinar. And then I'll get your email and know that you want to attend and send you the Zoom meeting details through email like I did for this one. So thanks again, everyone, to, for coming out. And uh, yeah, I hope to see many of you in October and keep this great discussion going. Uh, it was really fascinating. And I'm uh, really happy that we all, we all made this initiative and, and managed to get together for this. It was great. All right. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs>